Hey guys, welcome back to RBR. I'm your host Raz and welcome to our first drive of the brand new GLC, the newest version of Mercedes' most popular car. And what an evolution the GLC has had over its years from the boxy, loose origins it had in the GLK to the last generation where it dethroned the previous most popular car, the C-Class, and headlined with monsters like the GLC 63S that for most of its life cycle was the king of the ring. Today's car builds upon this and Mercedes have really thrown the kitchen sink at it. It's now more grown up and it brings into account the changes in our world in terms of electrification and have now made a car that is truly compelling as a daily vehicle. And in that regard, what better version to test than the top of the range GLC 400E, their most powerful plug-in hybrid, 380 plus brake horsepower, electric only range claimed of over 100 kilometers. This is gonna be really interesting. Today, I'll peel back the skin. I'll show you what they've changed compared to the last generation in order to achieve these better figures. I'll also show you some of the future in terms of what's coming for GLC, including some new body styles. And finally, we'll go out for a drive and see the different driving modes available in this hybrid version of this, the new GLC 400E. So guys, today's episode of RBR has been kindly sponsored by Air for Life, who make air sanifiers for both your car and your home. This is the little device, this is the one that plugs into your car, and this uses NASA developed ionization technology. Now what these actually do in reality is pretty amazing. Once you plug it in, these will eradicate 99.9% .9 of bacteria and viruses, not just in the air, but on surfaces and seats as well including stuff like coronavirus, all right? This can also help negate the symptoms of allergies, asthma, hay fever as well. And perhaps what's even more useful just for daily car guys like us is that it can remove odors from the car as well. You plug it in and an hour later, it'll get rid of pet odors, cigarette, food odors, etc. It's super easy to use. You simply just plug it into your 12 volt and that's it. There's no maintenance, there's no filters to change. And as well as storm gray, you can also get it in stealth black or in the white finish. This is a super useful device to have in your arsenal as a car user, or even more if you're anything to do with public transport, right? It's like taxi driving, car sharing, car rental companies. You guys need to have this. It's gonna be a game changer. Now, of course, as an RBR viewer, you always get a good discount. So you will get 25% off. Use the code RBR on that link below. Or there's a second option with them. They've just opened for the first time ever, private investment all through Crowdcube and all you need to do is buy 10 or more shares and they'll give you a free one anyway. And the details of how to do all of that is in the description below. Guys, many thanks for always supporting our sponsors. Now back to the episode. So guys, like any best-selling product from any manufacturer of anything in the world, the GLC is super important to both Mercedes and its customers. So they are really throwing the kitchen sink at this generation today. And what I mean by that is, they're not really rewriting the rule book because the last generation was so damn popular. So what have they done here? They've done the same formula that the last generation followed, which was taking the best of their saloon cars and turning that into a mid-size SUV. So our brand new GLC sits on the same MRA2 brand new platform that is used also by the C-Class and the S-Class. But now it's been upgraded for electrification and for better handling dynamics. So then with the GLC, every model is either hybrid assisted or a full plug-in like this. Every single car is also formatic all-wheel drive. And finally, every car gets the nine-speed automated gearbox as well. Now, in terms of the mild hybrid assistance, it's much like we first saw in the 53 AMGs. So we have a 48 volt system powering the entire car. We have an uh, integrated starter generator or ISG that sits in between the engine and the gearbox that gives a mild hybrid boost of about 14 brake horsepower and 200 Newton meters and gives that extra little kick right when you need it low down below before your combustion engine has time to spool up. So you'll find that mild hybrid assistance in any engine without the E at the end of it. So something like a GLC 200 formatic, for example, or all the other variants. Now the plugins, much more interesting. They package these in terms of the batteries and the motors, etc 
much better than in the previous generation, so you don't lose that much boot space, which I'll show you later. Now, in these plug-in hybrids, be it in the 300E or the 400E, or indeed the diesel variants that are available, you'll find a 31 kilowatt battery that is packaged in the rear. That's your first point. Then we have a permanently synchronous electric motor on our front linking to the combustion engine. So for example, here on our GLC 400E today, the combustion engine by itself gives about 250 brake horsepower. But adding on this hybrid system, that system brings along 440 Newton meters, which is huge, and 135 brake horsepower. So we're talking total system output of over 380 brake, 650 Newton meters, and a zero to 60 of 5.6 seconds. But even more impressive is, in this generation, we've got claimed range of over 100 kilometers on pure electric driving, which is actually brilliant and really makes this car viable for daily use. And you will find that both on the 300E and on the 400E that we are testing today. We'll check that out in a minute and see how accurate it actually is. These plug-in hybrids also have an electromechanical brake booster, which basically regulates the braking between your recuperation system and your hydraulic braking to make sure A, that it's seamless, and B, that you're recuperating as much power as possible. But the downside to this system, 400 kg of additional weight versus a normal combustion or mild hybrid GLC, putting this 400E at a porky 2355 kg which is very, very heavy. The suspension is a new four-link setup on the front and multi-link on the rear. On our 400E, we've got adaptive air suspension as well that we'll see working as we go for a drive later as well. That will make the car a lot more comfortable than the GLC used to be, and that is an option that's available across the board on GLC. And of course, finally, on our rear axle, we've got rear axle steering of up to 4.5 degrees, which again, it's brilliant. It's more than the C-Class, and it's really gonna help make this slightly larger car feel more nimble as we're doing speeds. Then we come to the design. This MRA2 platform for the GLC, it's a little bit longer, slightly wider, slightly shorter in height, however, but all in around, around about the same size. We've got more space in the rear for our occupants, more space for that battery packaging as well, etc. But when you compare it to the previous generation, you can see that they've, they've made it a little bit more grown up. Things like the wheel arches can now be ordered painted just like the higher end GLE and GLS, which gives it a bit more of a grown up look. Our front bonnet sits a bit higher as you see it morph there. Our lights now link into a wider, perhaps slightly more feminine grille in this version anyway, but it's certainly more upright. And we've got quite an aggressive A-wing at the bottom here. Sadly, our wheels today on this car, not very impressive, are they? The bigger wheels that are available on this look so much better and it just, makes the entire car look fantastic. In fact, I think it even looks good with the plastic wheel arches as well. So you can really configure this any way you like. The roof line is slightly changed as well, particularly towards the C pillar, where it kind of curbs up, upward a little bit now. The rear, I'm not sure about, because it's got the same lights as every Mercedes rear these days, whereas GLC was a little bit, you know, unique. But I still like it. I still think it looks handsome. One thing I hate is the fake pipes. Why have they done this? They need to fix it, it's just, I just, I can't, I can't do it. It's just wrong. What's gonna look even more handsome, speaking about rears, is finally the coupe has been spotted out on the run. We weren't sure last time whether, whether they were gonna do it. They would have been mad not to, because it sold so well. So yes, a GLC coupe is definitely coming um, in all variants as well. So that's gonna be a pretty handsome looking car. But do I prefer the old one or the new one? I don't know. Hmm. Um, overall, I'm still a fan of the previous version, I'll be honest with you. I think it looked a little bit better, but I'm biased because I, I keep getting the AMG in my head. But then I've got that problem. I can never get AMG out of my head. So let's talk about AMG. Let's talk about AMG. The first one coming, GLC 43, which will feature that one man, one engine, M139L, four cylinder engine, probably around about 400 brake horsepower. Newton meters of 500, zero to 60, I think it's gonna be slow, but don't rule it out just yet because if this plug-in hybrid is doing 5.6 and it's 400 kg more, this hasn't got any of that weight. It's gonna be just the mild hybrid setup with the one man, one engine. So it could be a really good car. We saw the C43, the additional, uh, the rigidity strengthening and the AMG suspension and the steering, how that made that car so exciting. 
they could well do that for this GLC 43 as well. Of course, it'll get in terms of design, it'll get the grill, it'll get bigger wheels, pipes in the rear, but it'll really be limited to that type of upgrade. The real big upgrade will come with the GLC 63S, which is gonna wholesale pull everything from our future C63. We've heard some videos of it actually, and it doesn't sound that bad. It seems like AMG are bringing back the old A45 bark on upshift and the car actually sounds pretty impressive. So though we're losing the V8, it's nice that we have some kind of oral character coming from the engine. I just hope it makes it to the production version because I quite like the sound of the old 45s. Now in terms of what's powering this, yes, that one man, one engine, four cinder unit from the 43 is still there, but in the 63, it pumps out more power by itself, up to 470 brake horsepower, and that's thanks to the MGUH or the electric gas turbocharger like in the AMG one. Additionally to that, we have the P3 hybrid system that sits at the rear. This is from the new C63. So we have the EDU with the permanently synchronous electric motor, the two speed uh, dedicated gearbox transmission in the rear, and finally the limited slip differential all in that little unit. Above that sits the AMG performance batteries, 560 cells all individually cooled, again, just like the AMG one. And this whole unit gives an additional peak power of 200 brake horsepower. So we're talking system output of up to 670 brake in a simple GLC 63, right? Mid-level SUV, which is pretty crazy. You're gonna have less weight on the front because the front engine is lighter than the V8 by about 45 kg. Yes, it's 200 kg heavier than a normal GLC, but you know, it might work out because the, the weight is lower. So it could be a nicely dynamic car. So that's the future of GLC. Today we have our plug-in hybrid that we're gonna discover together. Let's first check out some hybrid specific bits of the interior and the boot, etc. What's happening with that? And then drive this GLC 400E and see what it's like on the road. Right now, charging every day with the plug-in hybrid, it's not actually gonna take that long. Even in the charging setup that I have in my house, which is seven kilowatts, a battery like this might take three to four hours, which is not bad. And like I said, you're gonna get 60 miles range or we will check that as we jump in the car. But for your daily commute, if that works, super easy and on a fast charger it's like half an hour to fill the whole thing up so guys my favorite thing in the glc interior is watch this watch this watch this <laughs> yes that's what i've been amusing myself with on this trip but no this is a lovely interior um i like the c-class interior particularly when it's decked out in a much better interior like this red and black setup. I hate it when it's just plain black, but this looks really nice and it really shows the best parts of the interior. Now, just like the previous GLC, they haven't gone to rewrite the book here. They've taken pretty much the entirety of the C-Class interior and brought that into GLC. So it does feel more like an SUV. The structure of the dashboard, you know, it sits a little bit lower. You see more of the bonnet. You're sitting that much higher. The screens dip that much lower. Um, and it's a bit more of a commanding presence. You know, you've got kind of a much bigger um, side window sill over here as an example as well. And it all feels a little bit more Mercedes SUV, but all very familiar to new C-Class as well. New steering wheel, the lovely MBUX. I know everyone calls it an iPad screen, but in actual use, like I found in my SL, it's a brilliant relayer of information that's really, really clear. And I think that's my main takeaway from it as someone who's been using it in a, in a new car. Now, this particular car is a plug-in hybrid, okay? So there are many things in here that are specific to hybridization. And the great thing about the GLC 400E is that you get a lot of the benefits of, say, an EV, like stuff that I find and I love in my Taycan that I normally don't get in my combustion cars. For example, pre-cooling or pre-heating your vehicle setting charging schedules for whether you're at home, whether you're at work, stuff like that can all be done within this. And then of course, if you're going into cities like London, etc., you're availing all of the benefits in terms of much, much cheaper parking, sometimes free, you know, no congestion charge, etc., etc. that type of stuff in your various cities, you can avail thanks to the fact that this is a proper plug-in hybrid as well. So you cannot discount that element of owning these cars. You'd get some specific screens here, 
which are all to do with hybridization. So for example, our charging screen here, when we were almost fully charged, it was telling us well over 100 kilometers for the electric only range. So that's great because I thought it was gonna be a lot less. You can see the charging uh, screen here, which has got all the different settings here, including quick charge, which is something that you can choose to have it charge a lot quicker, but it does reduce the life of your battery a little bit. You've got consumption, energy flow, which is quite interesting. It shows you layout of battery, etc. cetera. Um, vehicle, which gives you your suspension height and all the other bits and pieces. And this is stuff that you'll see in your normal Mercedes as well. So some good hybrid specific screens there. Your driver zone gets a few ones as well. I'll talk more about that when we're driving. Then the GLC gets this really cool off-roading specific screen. And this has quite a lot of important information on it. For example, if we jump in here, you've got a whole side here for suspension. I can raise suspension if I press this button here. You'll see the car raising up and then you'll see on each wheel how much it's raised within the screen. You see the tire pressure as well. You see the angle that the car is sitting. You have a compass at the bottom as well. Then we can go into the amazing invisible bonnet screen. We press this and the 360 camera function of the car will as you start to creep forward, start to tell you what is underneath the front bonnet, which again for off-roading, so useful. How many people are gonna be off-roading this car? If we look at the millions and millions of sales that GLC has done, I can wager it's gonna be under a single percent, I reckon, of people who will actually off-road it. But that's the technology. Undoubtedly, it's gonna come into stuff like G-Wagon in the future as well, debuting here in GLC because Mercedes want you to know that if you wanna do it, you can absolutely do it because it is a proper off-roading car and you can even do off-roading on the pure EV mode as well it's not just in the combustion mode which is very very impressive actually in terms of other mod cons the interior is great you've got you know lots of storage space you've got the great cup holders in here that we discovered when we first saw the car USB-C charging mat the big screen as I said pointing towards you the lovely vents up here as well driver zone with all the different design displays etc um, I've changed the zero layer on the main screen here from navigation to your more friendly looking MBUX screen with the icons and it's a great interior nice and spacious nice high commanding position really sporty yeah don't like the steering wheel but ain't too bad this is a really nice interior to spend a lot of time it's really luxurious and if you're a previous GLC owner I want to stress that this is a really big upgrade for you now let's talk about rear space because it's pretty important for mid-sized Mercedes SUV let me shuffle behind the driver here and you've got really good space in here. Remember, this is the plug-in. Despite the fact that we've got the extra hardware in here with the battery, etc., nothing is affected in terms of your, your leg room or what the seating position here is. So like we first sat in the GLC, lots of leg room. Haven't got the pan roof in this one. So, you know, head height is absolutely fine as well as it was in the pan roof version. And it's comfortable. It's just like C-Class. The seat stitching, exactly the same, the type of leather that's being used. This is a lovely interior, as we said, so it really shows it off the best. And really, if you're used to GLC, you've got a little bit more room in the back here. Like we said, MRA2 platform affords you a bit more space in the rear. The cars are always growing these days, so at least the rear occupants can enjoy this a little bit more. So you're going to like this as long as the driver isn't driving stupidly fast in this really heavy and really large um, plug-in hybrid, as you will see later. Apart from that, it's really, really comfortable in the rear. Now the other differentiator is boot space if you're going for a combustion car or the plug-in hybrid. I want to show you the difference between those two now. Now for the boot, let's start with our normal combustion car. As you can see, large aperture, nice flat floor, lots of space. In fact, under here, you've got even more room, tons and tons of it. In fact, there's probably like 30 centimeters depth more in here to store stuff so you can get rid of that cover if you want. Obviously, you've got the split folding seats here. But then when you go in the plug-in hybrid, you lose a bit of space. Not as much as the past, but you do lose some. Let me show you that. All right, guys, let's talk about, yikes, boot space. Because plug-in hybrid, we've got the batteries in the rear, extra hardware. So you've got a bit of a bump compared to the other boot that you've seen. So you lose a little bit of space, but I brought some bags in here just to kind of give you an idea. So you can see we've got quite a few things in here. You could probably still fit a baby's pram, etc., as well. Um, underneath here is a place where you can charge, uh, put your charging cable, sorry, as well. So a good place to store those. 
It's not too bad compared to the previous generation, how much you lost in the rear. This is actually putting that entire system in here in a pretty decent way. And of course, if you want to, you still have the option of split folding the rear seats. So lots of space to be had in the rear, despite the fact that this is a plug-in hybrid. But if you really care about rear space, you're gonna have to go for one of the normal combustion cars. Right, now we're gonna start, first of all, in electric only mode in dynamic select, because that's kind of, for me, when I'm thinking about 400E, this is the pull towards this car to me. It's doing your daily commute like an EV, but in a car that's, you know, it's a hybrid. It's got the combustion element as well. And we're being quoted, as you can see on the screen here, 100 kilometers, just like it was predicted in the official figures, which is nice because often we're just left disappointed, right? But that seems quite accurate. So let's get going. There is no sound for turning on the car in EV mode, nor does there appear to be any sound as you start driving. That's a bit of a disconnect, isn't it? Because when we tried the GT63 SE Performance or whatever the heck the long name of that car was, it maintained the EV sound from EQS, EQE, etc., alongside the combustion car. And that's something that I actually loved about that car, that you had the best of both worlds. And I was expecting that coming into this because, you know, this is their latest plug-in hybrid in the GLC, um, you know, just about to be released to the public, but they haven't got any of those sound profiles in here. That's not to say that they couldn't add it later with a software upgrade, but having driven the GT63e and then driving this, it just feels weird that it hasn't got it. It was such a nice thing. You get an electric startup, an electric shutdown, and then acceleration sound, deceleration sound. It was nice, and I like that. Now, driving a GLC-shaped car in full EV mode is so weird because the last car of that kind that I drove, I hated, which was the EQC, because it looked like a horrible, ugly soap bar, whereas this is a gorgeous, probably one of the best looking Mercedes SUVs. And I'm driving it in full EV mode with, you know, approximately 60 miles worth of range. And for a lot of us, that is, you know, more than enough in terms of what you're gonna use daily, commuting here and there from work or doing school runs, grocery runs, etc. Um, and even if you've got a bit of petrol consumption in between that using hybrid mode, you know, who cares? Most of it is EV usage and it's super, super cheap, especially with, you know, fuel prices today. So this is nice. I've got a car that just looks like a normal Mercedes Benz, but I've got a fully EV mode. And this is what I want from Mercedes. I want normal cars with EV ability. Now, interestingly, when you're in EV mode, you can choose the recuperation modes that you have in your fully EV Mercedes-Benz cars as well, which is nice. Just like I was saying earlier that you get the other benefits of having an EV, like pre-cooling your car, um, charging, uh, profiles, etc., etc. You get that benefit of having, for example, one pedal driving, which I'm doing now, we're in D minus, where the car is braking itself as we're going through this corner, and then I apply the accelerator and then it does that. So you've got your one pedal driving. You also got the auto, which actually takes the route that you have and then it brings in the braking and the recuperation and the hybrid use and that element all within there. So like I said, all those bits from, from your full EV Mercedes finding their ways into the plug-in hybrid as well, which is great. The other thing I like is I've got sports display on here and it's got an EV specific display where normally you've had the red rings for showing when you're revving the petrol engine when EV mode is on, you've got blue rings that either pulsate towards you when you're applying power, or they seep inwards and glow blue when you're regenerating energy. So it's, again, it's quite clever and it's quite clear when you're using the EV mode when you're using the petrol mode. So for example, if I go into dynamic select and I choose hybrid mode now and I put my foot down, you'll see that the red circles came up as soon as the petrol engine engaged. What's nice is the refinement of the four cylinder in here is such that when we were driving this car initially in hybrid mode, I could not tell when the combustion engine was on and when EV had taken over. It's that seamless. They kind of work really, really well together. And what you get at the end of it is a really good luxury experience where you're not bothered and you don't care which bit of the powertrain is being used because it's just being done quite seamlessly. Hybrid mode, like I said, gets even more intelligent when you begin to factor in your route into its own navigation. So, you know, don't use CarPlay, use the actual Mercedes navigation. Then it will begin 
to use the hybrid element, the recuperation um, and all of that intelligent planning on your route a lot better to make sure that you're using your battery power as efficiently as possible. Now we are beginning to pick up a bit of speed here in hybrid mode and it's got a lot of pull, right? 380 plus brake horsepower, it's pretty good for a, uh, a normal GLC, right? But again, it's weird if I'm in hybrid mode and I'm playing around with the paddles thinking that I'm going to be driving a bit more sporty. I can't because it's actually changing from D- minus to D auto and all those different recuperation modes. So in order to drive with a bit more spirit, we're going to go into sport mode and that's when my paddles then become the manual gearbox. And it is pretty much the slowest manual gearbox that you will ever find. Pressing down shift will take about a year before it goes from four into three and even longer to go from three into two. This is much more of a luxury setup, right? This is very much like old Mercedes. So if you're coming into this thinking that you're going to be using the paddles for anything other than trying to predict the future and when the gear will actually change, then you're going to be sorely disappointed because this is not the type of gearbox software that's geared for anything other than luxury driving. Power is good, engine response really good. Obviously you've got both the combustion engine and our electric motor all working together. It's a permanently excited one like you'd find in the best EVs, EQS, EQE, etc. Um, the car really feels its weight. It does 400 kg over a normal GLC. And of course you're gonna feel it. Um, this is something where the GLC 63S is gonna be much better placed, only adding 200 and versus the previous GLC having less weight on the nose as well. But in this car, you know, you can't hide 400 kg worth of weight. Yeah, it's super hard to, to hide kind of the body roll. You know, 400E is not doing anything massively in terms of rigidity or, you know, active roll control, etc. Uh, we have got the adaptive suspension, but that really works more towards the comfort side more than anything. So it's not the type of car that you're gonna feel super comfortable flinging around. It's more about having enough power when it's added the weight of the the hybrid system and the battery that you know it doesn't feel slow or sluggish when you're doing normal stuff day to day and in that regard you know your engine response and your powertrain response is immediate it's really good in that you get an annoying tractor you've got the power immediately to get past the bugger no delay nothing like you know your older Mercedes engines without the added hybrid assistance that would invariably just have you know a bit of a lag because the engines just weren't as performance orientated as say an AMG and this because you've got that huge assistance and it is massive from the hybrid system the car really gives you power more like an EV and all of this is great for, for daily stuff I really see this car as a car that you would enjoy as your daily vehicle so the ride on these perfect Spanish roads is absolutely impeccable. Now I do expect even if you get the larger wheels you're going to be absolutely fine because the 400 e does have the adaptive damping anyway but I can't confirm that today. I didn't like the normal C-Class without the adaptive damping with the big wheels and I'm sure that that car is fine with it just like the C43 was. Now I would still get the larger wheels even if it's you know a little bit of a penalty in how nice and cosseting this current car is you need to have the look because it really makes a GLC look like a GLC rather than the spec that we have here today. And from what I can tell, this is feeling like a big old S-Class at the moment in terms of its suspension. So I don't mind a little bit more rigidity if we're gonna get bigger wheels that look way, way nicer. Steering is nice, you know, it's, it's nothing majorly communicative, etc. Like I said, this is more of a daily car. Now, if you're a previous GLC owner coming into this, what's gonna be a big culture shock for you is the tech stuff that we discussed. So the driver's zone while you're driving, the ability to switch modes and styles and get different types of information literally at the flick of a switch, you're gonna absolutely love. You're gonna love this larger screen that everybody calls an iPad screen over here because it is genuinely fantastic in terms of providing you the information that you want as a driver. Whether that's, you know, having a full screen navigation here because I need to know where I'm going, whether that's changing that to a more sporty layout well, that's having full maps here or engine readouts, wherever it might be, this is a really great system and it's positioning slightly tilted toward the driver, etc. All of that works really well. The other thing you're going to love is the ambient lighting, particularly when it gets a bit darker. 
such a massive upgrade over what we had in the past. All the colors that you get in S-Class, etc. It's a really nice feel and, a, and it's a nice ambience in the type of luxury car that this is now aiming to be. That much more expensive, but you're getting more bang for buck as well. What's nice is that technologies like Mercedes Drive Pilot self-driving, it's within the GLC, of course, just like you'd find in C-Class and S-Class, etc. to the same level. The car will simply just drive itself. The other thing that's great and it's really important for a plug-in hybrid or if we go say into EV mode is the refinement of not having noise inside the car which was the one thing that the EQC did really well. It was blot out outside noise and the new GLC I feel is doing just as good of a job because it's really quiet in here when you're in the EV mode. You're not getting that much tire noise, you're not getting that much wind noise and it's really quite refined. There's little things like that that over time make a car more enjoyable and more comfortable to use when it's geared toward this kind of luxury daily side. I think my favourite modes are both EV and hybrid. I really like the EV mode. It goes all the way up to 86 miles per hour if you need it as well. So perfect for countries like the UK. Um, and it's, it's a seamless switch when you're in hybrid mode between the two different technologies. Standout things for me are how the range is actually accurate. You will get 60 miles out of the large battery in this car which then makes up for the fact that it's that much heavier. Then you get all the benefits of EVs like pre-cooling or pre-heating your cars, you get all the benefits in terms of cost saving in the cities like London etc. So all of that that you would normally associate with your EVs, the benefits coming into this plug-in hybrid as well. And I can genuinely, like I said, see it as a fantastic daily family car that's going to be there for you in terms of cost saving, in terms of luxury. Now in terms of fun, this is not that car okay the car that I think is really going to take the cake is going to be the GLC 43 now think about it it's going to be 400 kg lighter than this car a bit more power AMG's own suspension their own steering that is going to be a really interesting car if you want to have a bit of fun beyond that the 63 also looks exciting they seem to have maybe brought in the flavor of the old 45s in terms of exhaust note which is cool it's going to be 200 kg lighter than this particular car as well but with, you know, potentially up to 800 plus brake horsepower, which is crazy, right? So a lot of fun cars in store for the GLC still, that might still awarded the accolades that it had in the past. If you're looking for a daily one, I think you have to go for a plug-in. I think the 400 is the right one. It's got the right amount of power that this car isn't ever gonna feel slow. Yes, you're not gonna be doing, you know, amazingly dynamic things with it, but it has the ability and the power it's got the range which is so important that is advertised and the refinement and the luxury and the tech that you want from a Mercedes that is costing what this car will cost. So guys, that's my first drive of the brand new GLC in 400E form. If you've enjoyed this episode of RBR, please do like and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you guys next time.